started. What do you say? Let's dive right in to our first 12 speakers. Uh, and they would like to, um, they have talks around the, on the topic of what is the city of my dreams? The city uh, of my dreams consists of the refugees, the refugees, the refugees, the refugees, and identity. The nuances of the city make it real. It's a place where I know no one can go yell dyke in their cars, where friends will not be attacked, where their cars are dancing the night away, where they can't the gay bar. It's a place where it's not an issue that I'm a lesbian married to another woman, that even the well intentioned folks don't need to tell me about their LGBTQ. We take care of our folks' experiences. We take down monuments to white supremacy and ensure the diversity of our city is not at risk because of racist policies. Those are the issues that keep me up at night and the reason why the lens to which I view nature, ecology, and resilience in cities must be intersectional and geared toward justice. These are the values I'm uncompromising about. When I have the luxury to think beyond that, I know that the city of my dreams is not static, it's dynamic. This city inspires enough wonder to challenge the comfort of my assumptions. This city's landscapes change enough with the seasons and over the years to remind me of impermanence. Every space is infused with function across ecological, social, and economic systems. In this ideal city, I don't believe in it or even wish for harmony. Wow. <laughs> I don't think I got all of that, but it was really interesting. Um, but I also understand you guys wrote a collective, a serial talk. Let's hear it. I am from an African city, and I work with local governments in Africa. Every day, I engage with rapid changes, complex environments, vibrant people, and vast amounts of innovation. Future cities must embrace nuance. They must develop new ways of thinking to guide how society works, and they must nurture strong relationships. If planet Earth is our mother, then soil must be our father. Seek the silent places where no jarring sound is heard and nothing breaks the stillness but the singing of a bird. Nature tells its secrets not to those who hurry by, but to those who walk with quiet heart and seeing eye. I hope that the Nature of Cities movement will grow around the world to make the treasure of nature and especially soil visible and to restore the connection between people and nature. I dream that it creates the ground for new urban cultures, opening space for respectful and resilient forms of coexistence between humans and non-humans, welcoming rivers, wetlands, meadows, forests, plants, animals, natural cycles, rhythms, and the poetic cultures they all nurture. And how can that poetry of people and nature become magnified by insisting that equity and justice are a part of the nature of cities charge? We must be uncompromising in our belief that the best urban cultures and natures cannot coexist and meld together without ensuring all people can experience it. I want an equitable, resilient city that empowers its citizens to take ownership of their own destiny in a sustainable way. Sir Patrick Geddes got it right over 100 years ago when he said that placemaking, although he didn't call it that, he called it planning, his task was to find the right places for each sort of people, place where they will really flourish. For places to flourish, ecological education must start since before babies are born, so all people understand their role in this wonderful world. Their interdependence with native ecosystems, and then nature will be in all cities bringing not only sustainability, sustainability and resilience, but for joy and harmony for all. I want to be able to walk up, over, and down buildings coated in ecosystems where nature is intricately woven into the built fabric of the city and where we don't have to ask who benefits from urban nature because we all have equal access to the clean air, cool breezes, and fresh food that it provides. According to uh, astrophysicist Nigel Calder, if Earth were a 46-year-old woman, humans have been around for just over half a week. 
Only a minute has passed since man began his industrial revolution. Yet in this short time, the impact we have had on Earth's environment is irreversible. I dream of cities where people are empowered to fight for the protection and enhancement of these interwoven ecosystems to ensure a natural as well as political re resilience against climate change. This will require an immediate infusion of openness and empathy, which are probably the most critical deficits of our entire half week on Earth. Without them, we will not share with other tribes, whether these are other ethnicities, other generations, or other species. And how does one find empathy and openness with other species? How do I cultivate a relationship with a river, with a mountain, with a tree? Does it come when I realize the nature within me? As cities become more and more populous, the vast majority of humans are living their entire lives in urban environments. Less and less people will know what wild nature looks, feels, sounds, and smells like. A large proportion of people will never be able to afford to visit the wilder areas of our planet. So rewilding cities is also rewilding ourselves. We dream of cities and the people that live there become more and more the engines of innovation, continuously creating new incentives for sustainable landscape management so that cities can become a hope for the planet. Along with the transformation of our urban landscapes, I dream of the transformation of our governance structures. We need to recognize the importance of civic innovation and create meaningful, authentic forms of power sharing and joint decision making between citizens and government which should also extend to building multi-level governance, recognizing the vital role that national government plays in enabling urban development. The, future, the, bu the building of a future city needs to focus on ensuring sustainability of activities by matching ambition and action with the mandates held at all levels of governance. So we must face corruption to enable all people dream and co-create urban environments. Otherwise, wealth will be, uh, continue to be con concentrated in the hands of a few that control the political arena. And the majority of people will prioritize the, to put food on the table in the next meal. So, so social justice is key to transform the urban landscape. We are all from the same planet. Cities are the places where people meet and discover the beauty and diversity of exceptional encounters. They can connect worlds which may seem miles apart, hold the key to dialogue, bridge differences in language, nature, culture and beliefs, and are the nursery for creative solutions that will make our world the most amazing home for future generations. So we are continuously seeking solutions to build the kinds of cities that foster all of these dreams. We discuss and we debate novel ways that our city makers can be simultaneously creative and innovative and so cities can evolve to natural, social, cultural, spiritual, artistic, and cohesive spaces. But there is pressure for us to end the debating and begin the actions. It is here that we find ourselves in this summit. A summit where we define five key urban goals and thematic pillars that reflect the cities of our dreams. Justice, livability, sustainability, health, and resilience. We must begin our actions by discarding apprehensions and inhibitions of engaging directly with our government officials, local area representatives, and professionals, and work together to create equitable and unbarricaded green spaces where nature becomes the real client, and all of us, its consultants. We begin with justice, and justice begins with us. With courage, we confront greed and short-sightedness. We reject the false narrative that barricades work better than flows. And we embrace cities' offer of contact, camaraderie, and common cause. We must put equity first. Greener cities that are more sustainable, more livable, more resilient, and more just must also be more inclusive and address the fundamental social inequities that ensure that so we ensure that all lives improve. 
But if we want to take our communities, whether professional or of interest with us, we need to look for nature-based solutions. We need to ensure that what we do has clear benefits for the environment, the economy and society. We need to co-produce solutions in a collaborative way. It's usefully summed up in the quote, nothing about us is for us without us. Well-designed cities and places are only great if they maximize the stacked benefits of our, e our ecosystems provide. We must look outside our own conception of us to be vulnerable, to lean in and let go of our assumptions in the spaces where we differ, and to fully realize the total and truly equitable potential of our cities. We must also look to many different ways of knowing, to different worldviews, epistemologies, and cultures. Privileging the modernist, rationalistic, scientific worldview helped get us into this mess. Let's acknowledge and amplify other forms of knowledge and ways of being that might help us forge a new way forward. Cities must be more aware of the regions where they are located and take responsibility for a sustainable urbanization. This would entail managing flows and interactions in a more sustainable way, where not only the cities are developing to become more fair, green, and accessible, but the whole region. Such bioregional awareness gave birth to one of our few examples of a sustainable metropolis. In deciding to give back to nature more than it took, Japan's Edo period government also gave individuals, neighborhoods, and villages creative license so that they could come up with unique solutions for their own regions. Today, here, each of us holds this creative license, too. Let's express our full creativity in answering the questions how can I best sustain life in the place I live in? How can I give back more than what I took? By each taking time to attune to the wide diversity of life cycles at play in the local landscape, we can welcome non-anthropocentric creative answers that will reshape the cities we live in. In cities, we face difference and realize that it is cause for curiosity and celebration. Together, we can address the uncomfortable and incomprehensible. We can better consider the impact of our actions on others in faraway places and times, and we can enrich life instead of extracting from it. And as we reflect and consider that all these questions posed, guide the development of tailor-made, context-specific solutions. A future city should build confidence of its decision makers. It should practically embrace the complexity surrounding decision making and financial and political influences. Spaces for ongoing learning, knowledge construction, visioning, and relationship building are key to solution development. The landscape is the stage, the support of all natural and human processes that can regenerate life for all. We need to enhance biocentric, biophilic, and love approaches to gather all the agencies, all agents of landscape transformation, aiming to re reintroduce native ecosystems in built and non built landscapes. We must bring along the young people that are already mobilizing the world about climate change to revolutionize the nature of our cities. But what information do we still need to make our decisions truly able to adapt to the constantly changing nature of cities? We need to harness the rapidly emerging and evolving data ecosystems, from IoT to social media data, to make sense of what our infrastructure, our ecosystems, and our residents are already telling us but we also have to understand the ethical challenges this data brings with it. And from these data and other repositories of knowledge, how can we visualize the sometimes unseen but crucial social forces that shape our urban realm? By rendering these visible, can we better dance with our social ecological systems? Freedom, dada, dada, dada. <laughs> A roaring of sense colors and interlacing of opposites, and of all contradiction, grotesque, inconsistencies, life, concludes Tristan Tsara in his Dada Manifesto in 1918, 
What we want now is also spontaneity, said Sarah. Not because it is better or more beautiful than anything else, but because everything that issues freely from ourselves, without the intervention of speculative ideas, represents us. We must intensify this quality of life that, ready, that readily spends itself in every quarter. Da 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 da. La 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 ra da 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 la da da da. Ra la la da 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 da. Da 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 da. Oba chan o ji chan ji ji baba. Ji ji baba ba baba la ra da da sa. Oh. Oh sa. Oh, sa, sa, la, la, da, da, la, da, 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 la, di, da, di, da, c'est la vie. Dada was a reaction to the social and cultural bourgeois, the business as usual, the hegemony of the elites. Cities of the future cannot be bourgeois, they cannot have elites. Nature is the great leveler. It treats all people as the same. It treats it provides nourishment for communities and individuals alike. Nature is irrational, unpredictable, surreal, making nature of cities very, very data. This very unpredictability is what makes it essential to engage with the environments around us and their various issues in a holistic way. Our engagements should range from design to pedagogy, research to conservation, from activism to participation all at once. In order to break away from the business as usual, we must blur the boundaries between these various modes of engagement and ensure that traditional practices perform within expanded narratives of their respective fields. Together, we can bring about the desired nature-driven change. But most of all, we must talk in plain language, take communities with us and design for understanding and social cohesion working in partnership with the nature-based solutions. Does it matter what we call it, as long as we understand why we're taking the actions that we are and that we are all comfortable with them? It's also not just about taking communities with us. We also need to go with communities. We must recognize that one of the largest, so, the largest barriers to social cohesion and collectively improving our cities is fear of change and unpredictability. As much as we advocate for large-scale change, we should also be advocates for teaching people how to cope with all scales of change from a young age. Pema Chodron said, what a predicament. We seem doomed to suffer simply because we have a deep-seated fear of how things really are. Our attempts to find lasting pleasure, lasting security, are at odds with the fact that we are a part of a dynamic system in which everything and everyone is in process. We may have come a long way in embracing a more inclusive approach in identifying the challenges ahead, co-designing what should be our priorities. We might also be on the way to collectively generate, co-produce new knowledge on how to create solutions addressing these challenges. In my mind, where we have failed is in working together to implement these solutions. The co-implementation where we joint, jointly evaluate and monitor for a collective learning of what works and what doesn't in each local context. And exactly that has been the vision of David Maddox and Mike Hauck when they started The Nature of Cities back in 2012, a network of the brightest thinkers, peaceful warriors, and brave heroes who show leadership in the way we work together in cities. And here we are today for the first global gathering, creating new connections, sharing ideas, and finding inspiration to do more than we ever imagined for creating cities that are resilient, just, Resilient, sustainable, livable, and just. These are some ideas that we have created together. Thank you. Dada lives, yes. <laughs> <laughs>